thanks for the um, opportunity to present this research. Um, this is a presentation about expectations of perfect adherence, and it's a finding from a qualitative study that we undertook to explore treatment failure amongst malarian adolescents um, living with HIV. This is a study that was undertaken in Chuadzulu in Malawi, where MSF France has been um, supporting the Ministry of Health to deliver HIV care and treatment programmes since about 2001. And despite this being a very well-supported programme with very good outcomes amongst adul adults, um, a recent cross-sectional survey has shown very high rates of first-line treatment failure among adolescents of the order of 30%. So in order to um, address this, MSF France um, is wanting to review their programme. And so we started by um, drawing on the existing evidence and found that it was quite limited in, in terms of um, giving us ideas about how to move forward. And in particular, there was a knowledge gap in terms of understanding how some of the social and contextual factors shape treatment adherence from the perspective of young people themselves and their caregivers. So in this context, the overall aim of the study was to explore how individual, social and programmatic factors can influence adherence to antiretroviral therapy among adolescents living with HIV um, in order to inform um, new interventions to promote adherence in this setting. And the particular analysis that I'll present today is a, um, just one component and that aim to explore how the social interactions of young people um, in different settings, such as the clinic, home and the community, um, could influence their adherence to treatment. So this is a qualitative study and we collected our data through um, repeated in-depth interviews with adolescents living with HIV. Um, we also did in-depth interviews with um, a range of caregivers including those of adolescents with, um, who were aware of their status and those who weren't. We also did interviews with um, members of the community who we felt held influence over young people's attitudes to HIV and treatment. So, for example, teachers um, and um, youth leaders and uh, village heads and so on. We also interviewed health workers from um, the Ministry of Health and, and MSF. We also carried out group activities, both with adolescents who knew their status and those who were unaware of their status, and we used participatory methods. So once we'd um, collected our data, they, those conversations were recorded, we transcribed them, we translated them into English. We incorporated other data as well, such as the photos from output of those group activities and text from the diaries that were maintained by the field workers, observations that we'd undertaken in health facilities and at various social events that were going on in the community. We then used an inductive approach to code the data, which means going through these texts and categorizing the emerging concepts and ideas that come through the data. And we undertook a thematic analysis to understand the relationships between those codes um, in relation to the um, objectives of the study. And we had approval from the study um, from ethical review boards in Malawi and the UK. So overall, we found that um, in this context of uh, very high rates of treatment failure, nevertheless, adolescents living with HIV, they had very good knowledge about HIV. They had very good knowledge about antiretroviral therapy, and they wanted to take their drugs. So that wasn't um, one of the main uh, reasons for this treatment failure that we'd seen. But we also found that their intentions to adhere were sometimes undermined by some of the social norms and expectations about young people, whether it was in the clinics, um, at home, or in the community. And we found that in each of those settings, adolescents' behaviours were very much regulated by very strict rules and obligations, and they were often accompanied by threats of negative consequences, such as disciplinary action or pu punishment for non-compliance with those rules. And we found that um, the attempts to exert control over their behaviours in each of these different settings was very um, a, an important driver of the um, undermining of their intentions to adhere to their treatment. So, for example, within the health clinics, we found that the, method, the, the health messages that adolescents with HIV were exposed to were incredibly strict and rigid. They were very much couched in the language of rules and regulations. It was about the, ne the absolute necessity to maintain perfect <coughs> adherence. We found that counselling and health messaging in general um, was very focused on treatment literacy, which could explain their very good knowledge about HIV and ART, but sometimes it went uh, perhaps too far in terms of um, trying to test adolescents looking for mistakes in their knowledge, rather than um, any um, conversations about um, uh, the challenges that they face. 
And we sometimes found that the consequences, is a, a, a typo here that should say, um, the consequences of less than perfect adherence were perhaps sometimes overstated by health workers. So for example, one caregiver told us, um, for example, the medicine's supposed to be taken at 6.15, and instead one takes it at 6.30. The medicine in this case doesn't work properly and the viruses keep on multiplying. The medicine doesn't work at all. And this was absolutely typical of um, <laughs> many of the counts that people had about the timing at which they were supposed to take their pills and whether it was um, the caregivers, the adolescents themselves, or even the health workers who felt that if you couldn't take it at exactly the right time, it was better not to take it at all. We also found that um, although many patients really appreciated the support that they had from health workers and, and particularly counsellors, there were just as many reports of adolescents being scolded or chastised, shouted at, and, and this really undermined their engagement with HIV care. And this picture comes from one of the group activities we did with adolescents with HIV, and they described this picture of a doctor as someone who was fat, grumpy, um, cross, he's frowning, he's got very expensive sunglasses on. And they said, other doctors are better off. But the kind that we've drawn here are those who cannot manage to stay for even 10 minutes while explaining to them about your problems. They would shout at you for delaying them. And as a result, we found that young people had very little opportunity to talk frankly about the, the challenges that they might be facing in taking their pills or to talk about the potential solutions um, to those challenges. Yet this was something that they very much aspired to in their relationship with health workers. As one particularly articulate um, uh, young man told us, he said, a patient came and he told us the names of the medicine, but it was not enough. I wish the health worker could try to encourage the patient other than just giving medicine names. I wish he could engage the patient in a dialogue, ask the patient how he's feeling, how he thinks the medicine will work, and even involve him in deciding the best time to take the medicine. And this is something that um, was clearly very absent in, in the narratives of all of our participants. We also found that some of the measures that were put in place to support adherence were actually perceived to be very punitive by adolescents, and that could also really undermine their adherence. So, for example, additional pill counts to see if um, people who were suspected of poor adherence were actually taking those drugs, um, sometimes going as far as make people wait longer because they hadn't been adherent, going to the back of the queue, having to come for extra appointments. These were things that were sort of supposed to uh, well-intentioned help um, for young people but they were perceived to be punitive. And one young boy said, if you come and get medicine for two months in advance, they would deliberately give you medicine only worth one month so as to punish you. And so we wound up wasting our transport money and other costs. But we found that these attitudes weren't just in the HIV clinics, but were also um, quite prevalent in the other he health services around. So, for example, we saw this notice on the door of a youth-friendly sexual and reproductive health clinic, and it says, translated, to all youths, this is not a meeting place for you and your lovers. If found doing that, you have broken our law. You will not be tolerated, but given a punishment proportional to the crime you committed. This is a reproductive and sexual health clinic, a, a youth-friendly sexual and reproductive health clinic, in one of the health centres where one of the HIV clinics um, that MSF was supporting. We similarly found that even in people's homes, um, young people faced um, a, a range of challenges. Their caregiving arrangements were often fluid, they were precarious, people were being passed around in many cases, particularly for those who are orphans. And in many cases, we found that children were being instructed to hide their HIV status, to hide their pills, to hide their pill taking from other family members, including their siblings. And this is often related to parents' fears of disclosing their own HIV status through inadvertently if the child's HIV status was known. People would go to extraordinary lengths to hide their pills in the home. One caretaker told us, OK, this is how I hide. There's a drum, and inside that drum there are books, and that's where we get these chairs, so no one would be interested to remove all those things in such a place. I also place the mattress on top. No one will step a foot in there. So people go to extraordinary lengths to hide pill-taking in the home. We also found that um, caretakers didn't engage in conversations about HIV in the home. And this really reinforced it as something that was um, a very shameful experience for uh, many of those young people. And even talk about um, reminders to take pills were often very directive. They were some, sometimes accompanied by threats or reprimands or punishments. And this often led to young people hiding the fact that they hadn't been able to take their pills as um, they'd wanted to, and even throwing away some of those pills. So overall, we found that some of these um, issues contributed to young people feeling isolated. There was secrecy, there was silence in the home around their HIV status and their um, ability to take their pills. It led to them feeling anxious and confused, and all of these things um, undermined their pill-taking. 
Within the wider community as well, we found that influential um, community members held strong views about people's social lives and their behaviours in general, including adherence. And we found that many of them felt responsibility, a certain role to help address stigma and to encourage adherence to ART. And they actually had a range of powers through which they could influence and regulate some of these social behaviours. So, for example, they could impose curfews or fines, for example, if someone was found to discriminate against someone with HIV. They could organise social events for young people, but they could also counsel them if they felt there was inappropriate behaviours. And these attempts also sometimes undermined people's adherence behaviours. One community member told us, there are others who, when they take their medicine and see that they are good, they stay without taking the medicine. They just stop. So when we find such things, we give them a threatening advice that if they do that, they won't be received at the hospital, and also we won't ref write those letters, that's re referral letters to groups and so on. So overall, we found that treatment failure couldn't really be explained by um, a lack of knowledge about HIV and ART, but it was far more likely to be undermined by an inability of young people to conform to some of the unnecessarily strict rules and expectations of adherence in the setting. We found that young people were fearful of the consequences if they were seen to be non-adherent, and this led to um, a lack of opportunities to talk frankly about those challenges, a lack of safe spaces um, in which they could discuss um, the challenges and pill-taking strategies. Based on these findings, we, we think that um, interventions should um, also move outside of the clinic and occur where the pill-taking occurs. So, for example, in the home, and this could be supported through um, home visits. We feel that interventions need to be more family-focused, giving um, support to caregivers as well as um, the young people um, to support disclosure within the household, address stigma within the household. We feel that there's... Um, further evidence to support MSF's advocacy for a counselling cadre to help support adherence, amongst, particularly amongst young people. We feel there's also a, a need to move away from ART literacy and move towards problem-solving skills in young kids and efforts to build their resilience. Um, and in this particular setting, um, more um, better and more peer clubs for them to get involved in. And we also think there's a need for um, tr supporting health workers to think about the messages that they're delivering and the impacts that they can have on young people, the style and the way in which they um, deliver those. As a result of um, the study and others, um, a revised model of care is being um, developed now in Chiradzulu and will be rolled out later this year. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.